Paul Kelly has been a major player in the Australian music scene for over 40 years. As a songwriter, a performer and a collaborator, his work is characterised by deep insight, compassion and great storytelling. Paul Kelly, welcome to the Australian Music Vault. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for that very nice intro. <laughs> Let's do a little time travel. Uh, you grew up in Adelaide, one of eight children. Was there music in the house, firstly from from mum and dad and then maybe from the siblings? Uh, music always in the house, ABC Radio, and I uh, remember hearing classical music a lot in the house. Mum played piano and sat, sang sometimes. Dad loved music but couldn't play. Um, we all had piano lessons. It was compulsory. It's in 1960. Um, all so with the same teacher? All with the same teacher. So she would come to the house, Mrs Seacamp, and... Um, do us sort of a few of us in a row. Um, and we had to get, get her a glass of milk and pour some brandy in it. And that was Mrs. Seacant's drink while she, while she taught us. A little bit of brandy. Brandy and milk, yeah. I did it for two years, the age of 10 and 11. And, and that's, that stayed with me, some very basic theory, which I'm eternally grateful for. And then my sister was going out with this guy who played the trumpet. And uh, I really like this guy. And uh, um, I, I said I wanted, you know, I wanted to learn the trumpet too. And he brought some records around, some um, Louis Armstrong and the Hot Five. Yeah. And this, I was 12 years old. I heard Louis Armstrong for the first time, early early Louis Armstrong recordings, and it sort of just exploded my brain. I said, couldn't figure out how are all these people playing like just not, as if they're playing individually but they're making this sound together. It was sort of... Beautiful chaos to me and really exciting. So I wanted to learn. I said, can I learn the trumpet? And it just so happened the school was starting, a, starting up a, a proper brass program and they brought in the teacher. And um, so I, you know, I got the lecture from mum and dad. If you're going you're gonna to move instruments and go to the trumpet, you can't give it up after a year. You've got to stick with it. So I did it all through high school, five years, played trumpet. And... And then I also remember mum buying like a three album set of Herb Alpert and the Tijuana Brass. And I, I played, you know, played a few of those songs and used to lie in the dark listening, listening to that. Imagine myself playing the trumpet. Yeah, so I like, I like working with um, horns and trumpets and off, often get uh, arrangements done and we, we put it on a song. And what about the brothers and sisters? So was there music was coming into the house and perhaps through the older sisters. Well, Anne, Sheila, Martin and John were the, the ones above me and they, so, yeah, they brought music into the house. It was, it was, first of all, it was Anne and Sheila with, you know, singles, um, early Beatles singles, uh, Tommy Rowe, Sweet Little Sheila, um, I remember. And Sheila was playing guitar, so she, she taught me my first chords, a Peter, Paul and Mary song. Uh, I'm in love with the big blue frog. Um, so it's got all the chords you need for if you ever want to write songs. Right. About four or five chords. And uh, so that was, that was, that was um, I guess, th those songs were coming in from Anne and Sheila then and then in came the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and Bob Dylan and that was, you know, Mark. Their older brothers were probably more involved in that. Um and, and then, all... then, in, then in Pink Floyd, Moody Blues, yes. Jethro Tull and um, all, all that. So, And music with a conscience, was there, were there discussions around the house with mum and dad? What was, was family or dinner time, meal times, was there vigorous conversation about perhaps the affairs of the day? I guess what, you, what they call the counterculture was, was becoming strong. Martin and John both went on hunger strikes against the Vietnam War, um, you know, took part in the moratoriums. So um, that, you know, new ways of thinking were coming to the house. And were you attracted to it? Oh, yeah, I, you know, yeah, I was sort of soaking it all up. Yeah. I mean, it, was, it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't to me, it wasn't, it was more cultural and the p politics was within that. Then Dad died in 1968, so Mum had, you know, eight kids and the uh, uh, and older ones sort of growing hair long, smoking pot, 
de demonstrating against Vietnam War. So she had a, a lot, a lot to, a lot on the plate, a lot to handle, and a lot to, I guess to get her head around. And um, she did. You know, so there was fights I think early on about growing the hair and so on, but she sort of she backed us. She backed them. She backed them in their uh, in the strikes and so on. So um, she was strong like that. Yeah. How old were you when your dad died? Thirteen. Thirteen. He died in the night of a heart attack. Suddenly, he was fifty-two. I had no no idea it was happening. You know that that it was he was he had Parkinson's before that for a few yeah. years, so he was getting quite shaky, um, and, and couldn't you know couldn't run, couldn't walk fast, um, all those things. But um, and he'd also gone to Sydney for an operation to try and fix it. But then, as a side effect of having Parkinson's, he, he got the heart attack. And um, we just got sent to school school that day. Just, I remember Mum saying, "It's no point, you know. It's no point sort of moping around the house, <laughs> something like that." And was she distraught? She's, I, you know, she was. She had things to do. It's it's always the way when someone dies. You just you've got to, a lot of stuff to do. It's later on that I think it gets harder. And we was we had the uh, dad's body in the house. I mean, this is sort of uh, I guess old. Irish traditions and um, uh, that was it there for a couple of days and then I just remember lots and lots of people coming to the house, visiting the house. Because he bringing, was a popular man. Bringing food. Mum and Dad, yeah, they had a big big circle of friends, yeah. And, you know, the Catholic Church, they were, they were devout Catholics. And has that popped up in songs over the years? Uh, it pops up. I think Dad's hands used to shake, but I never knew he was dying. It's a line from a song called Adelaide. Yep. Children and parents uh, crop up a lot in my songs. So I guess that's more to do with coming. Maybe it's coming coming from a big family and 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 uh, sort of it being the most important thing. We're all a bit more scattered these days, but we still have yep. gatherings, whether it's for Christmas or yep. significant birthdays or we just. You know, people come yeah. come down. We, we like each other's company. Beautiful. And yet you fled the coop, uh, went, finished school, went to uni just for a bit, but then travelled for a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, I went to uni at, at a time, this is 72, Flinders Uni in Adelaide. I did philosophy, drama and history, you know, yep. sort of pretty, I guess, sort of soft subjects. But anyway, I ended up leaving after... I think a term and a half. I just wanted to just read, read in my own way and follow my own nose as far as things I was interested in. But the really is sort of the valuable thing about that short time at Flinders Uni is I met a, a gang of musicians or people who played music, um, and that's when I first started. Um, but I didn't play guitar at that stage, so I started picking it up a bit after that. But that was through these through these guys, um, Tom and Craig and a whole lot of others, and playing playing Neil Young, um, oh, those bands, Commander Cody. Oh yeah, um, Flying Burrito Brothers. Wow! First time I heard Graham Parsons. Um, so Dylan, um, Dylan. I was already into Dylan from that had come through the house through yep. through the older siblings. So yeah, Dylan, Neil Young. Um, a lot of country, country rock. But, yeah, yeah. That was a big discovery for me. So you were singing. If you weren't playing guitar, I was more mainly. I was playing the bongos for a while, just <laughs> hanging out, not really singing. I love it. <laughs> Writing songs? No, not then. No, no that didn't happen till a few years later. I, I wrote my first song when I was twenty-one. So yeah. So this was happening a few years before that. Yeah. But so then I, I learned guitar from the age of eighteen. I learned off this group, and then. Uh, there's Craig um, who showed me chords um, and then was, there was a folk, you know, some folk clubs around town. The Catacombs was a place in Adelaide. There was a singer called Dave Clark who I used to watch a lot. And, uh, he played a song called The Streets of Forbes, a song about um, the Bush Ranger. Um, ben Hall. Ben Hall. And that was probably the first song I learned. Working, learnt his sort of learnt his version of it, 
And then started, you know, learning songs, Neil Young and Dylan songs and, and so on. If going overseas then was seemed such a, like a, sort of so out of reach. It was, um, didn't seem easy, unaffordable. So it was just travel around Australia. That's, yeah. that's what I did. So um, the first year after school I travelled around, up north and out west. Yep. Then tried uni the year after, after my, you know, what was, they didn't call it the gap the year, gap then, year. but it was a gap year. Yeah. Um, and then, but didn't last long at uni, so just ended up uh, around Adelaide for a while and doing some more travelling. And then, I, was, you know, I'd started to play guitar. Yeah. and um, Which sort of leads us to the first gig in, in Hobart, I believe, where you played Ben Hall. I played oh, Ben. The Streets of Forbes. Streets of Forbes. Yeah. Played that song. Do you, how much do you remember about that first gig? I was there with my friend John Kingsmill, a lifelong friend. That's, in fact, I met him in Hobart in Tasmania and uh, I was very nervous and I got I drank. I remember I drank too much so I don't remember that much except he, he helped me get home, put me to bed, I think. <laughs> but um, I How many songs? I just did two, Girl from the North Country and, and Streets, The Streets of Forbes at a folk club in Salamanca Place, which has since burned down. And then I went and worked on the West Coast at Savage River Mines for a while and then... And then I, th- I think I thought I, oh, I'm not really cut out for this. Labouring. No, no. Oh, for Being music. A, yeah, singing. So, um, I was still, you know, pro- sort of writing prose, po- mix of prose poems. Yes. Um, there's a, a Baudelaire book called Paris Spleen, which is very short pieces. So, but they were prose, but he's. He was a poet first yep. and foremost, so they were poetic prose. So I was sort of writing things like that for a while. When I got back to Adelaide after Tassie, John and I started a, a literary magazine, magazine called Another One for Mary. So I was writing those prosy pieces for that and I, I sort of stopped on, on playing guitar and music and then, um, then sort of picked it up again later. So that... There was a long gap between that f- that first yeah. performance in Hobart to playing again. I think probably the next time I would have played again would have been Ginger's Coffee Shop in, in Adelaide. But there was a, a gap of a th- at least two or three years. And were some of those prose poems, did they end up turning into songs? No. No? No. No, but I did eventually start writing songs. So, yeah. But that, that was... I remember I was 21 when I wrote my first song, so that would have been 1976. And then that was sort of, oh, that was, that was sort of like a light bulb moment. Like, oh, I can do this. You sort of, if I can do one, I can do another one. So I was off. Yeah. What was the first song? Uh, there's a four-line song uh, which was played in open tuning, which is very much like the chords of Oxford Town by Bob Dylan, and it was... Uh, it's the going down that breaks you. It's the running around that it's the running around that breaks you. It's the going down that takes you. It's the falling apart that makes you something something. It was four lines that all had the same rhyme at the end. And that was it. <laughs> and then another one. I think we don't get on. I went to see Louise. Um, can't remember the rest of that. But then I wrote songs like I wrote some a song called Cherry and a song called Derailment. Time will cheat us. And then that stage I'd met James Black and he lived in Adelaide then. And he was kind of like boy wonder, James Black, you know, played music beautifully, could, you know, build things, record. One of those guys could do everything. And we, so I'm probably jumping ahead a bit, but we started, I'd started the band. This must have been 76 or 77. You know, I moved to Melbourne August 77. Um, so it was somewhere around those two years. I started the band called The Debutantes. And um, with James and Phil White. Uh, Mary Jo, my sister, was in it for a while. Um, John Highland on pedal steel. Tom Stelic on drums. Um, again, that was f- fairly... Um, that might have been a slightly changing lineup over time, but we started doing shows at uh, a pub in North Adelaide, 
And all your songs? All my songs. So you're the songwriter? I'm the songwriter, yeah. And they're all happy with that? I don't, uh, you know, find it, you find out later that maybe not everyone was that happy, but <laughs> I must have just bulldozed my way through. And then with that, some of those songs, then James uh, set up tape recorder at, at, back at uh, the, the, home, the family home, yep. my family home, and we recorded four songs, derailment, um, Cherry, Time Will Cheat Us, maybe one other one. Well, Cherry, of course, ended up being part of the next group, the High Rise Bombers, and then recorded on the first Dots album. How was it coming to Melbourne in in that time? What was it, 70? I arrived in Melbourne in 77, the year Elvis yes. died. Right. So just before Elvis died. Yeah. Oh, that was very exciting. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd, again, I'd lucked out landing uh, in the share house um, through my friend Nick Lanus, who knew, knew these people in Melbourne. And um, that's when I met Chris Langman um, and the many others in that house. There, were, there was a band house. They were all in a band. So that was a huge education for me in terms of music because I just heard all this music that I hadn't heard before. Yeah. I mean, that's when I heard, first heard the Beach Boys, you know, without all really... I would have heard them on the radio maybe, but that's when I first sort of realised how great they were. The first Tom Petty record. Yeah, television. And te- television, Talking Heads, all that music. Just 77, so. Yep. Um, and Iggy Pop not long after. And that was a band house. They were, had a band. The band was called, they started off as Spare Change in Adelaide and they had to change the name because I think some band in England had that. They changed the name to Parachute. So they were, and they were, Big front room where they would practice in, so that was that was all going on. There's and the bands like the Bleeding Hearts were playing, um, very exciting. They were sort of, you know, they were amazing to me. You know, Eric Grabman and Martin Armiger were like these sort of gods that strode the earth in front of great big WBN speakers. You know, making this really heavy sound. So, sports so, and sports. Going to see sports. They were just over the road at, at uh, the Kingston Hotel. Kingston. And uh, yeah, seeing Steve. Yeah, seeing Steve Cummins play, and he, that, they had a, there was a lot of Graham Parker influence at that yes. point. That I was also listening to a lot. Um, I love the sports. Um, I remember thinking, well, if he, you know, he he seemed very awkward on stage, and I, I so was I, or when, whenever I tried to be. But I thought, oh, if he can do it. Well, I can too. You can be awkward on stage. You just yeah. got to get up there and give it a go. I felt like coming from Adelaide to Melbourne at that time, living in that house, you know, they were so musically literate. I learned, got a huge mu- musical education from them. You know, yep. John Cale and the Velvet Underground and, um, um, yeah, the list of records that I've heard for the first time was, was huge. And also, you know, French movies and, you know, all, all, the stuff, you know, books. Pram Factory. Yeah, Pram Factory was, go- was going on. So it was a, a big, you know, um, cultural feeding for me and, and learning about new writers, music, books, films, everything. Yeah. You know, that, and uh, so I just was sort of wide-eyed. I felt like a wide-eyed country boy come to the big smoke, coming from Adelaide to Melbourne. And then, you know, I was... Lucky in that um, my first band, the first time I put a band together, this is before the High Rise Bombers, it was Red Simons. Yeah. So. Um, uh, post Skyhooks. Yeah, post Skyhooks. Skyhooks have sort of broken up. Um, I think Bleeding Your Hearts broke up. Um, so Martin Farmiger was floating. Yep. Um, and Chris Langman knew all these people. So we, the first band was like, you know. Had Martin Armiger and Red Simons, Huck Trelaw on drums. Yeah. Um, Chris Langman playing guitar. Maybe, maybe more. But that was, I mean, when they played my songs, and like I'm, I'm playing with these sort of rock, you know, legends of the Melbourne inner city. And thing. you're singing. And I'm singing. Yeah. Are you leading the band? Trying to. Yeah. Yeah. Trying to. Yeah. They were my, they were my songs. And yeah. So they must have thought, oh, there's something. Songs, something mm. in the songs, 
that was sort of a one-off gig and then it, that sort of moved into High Rise Bombers. Yeah. And that was where Martin and I both wrote, wrote songs for that. Also Fred Cass on bass. and Sally Ford. Sally Ford in a floating, floating sort of horn section. Horn section. Yeah. But this, this is 78 now, 79. That was uh, my main memory is of people saying play faster because, you know, everything was punk, playing songs really fast. Yes. And my songs are mostly medium tempo. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that didn't last, we didn't last that long, maybe a year, and broke, broke apart. Um, you know, there was three, you know, Fred Cass wanted some, his songs, just, you know, there's Martin's songs, my songs, Fred Cass, and I think I just wanted to, a band and just go and work out just a band that could play my songs. Your songs. Yes. Yeah. And so the dots were born. The dots were born about 1980. Yeah, and there was many, many, quite a few lineups of that. And the dots had a very, um, a, a very strong sound, driven mostly by you. Oh, uh, pretty. I mean, I would say it was pretty, pretty collaborative. I mean, I, I, I was always pretty basic as a. Uh, Guitar player, a rhythm guitar player. Yep. And um, not someone who, come, who would come to the band with yep. with a riff or, or yeah, we have to play it this way and this is what I want the drum, the drum and bass to be doing. Uh, I just had, you know, the song. So there's very much a group effort about yeah. how to play the song. So not often, you know, um, people would have strong ideas about what it would sound or they would come up with a riff and that would be the song. So, But not lyrics. No, the lyrics are always mine. Yeah. Yep. Um, but that's still the way I work, you know, with bands I work with today or, you know, the squad that I work with today. Yeah. And, you know, it's pretty, can be pretty open-ended when I bring the song in. So, the song can, can change completely from how I imagined it. Sometimes it's quite, it's, it stays quite to what I had in my head. But, yeah, it's just being open to what other people bring to it. Mm. So those years with the Dots, I think uh, the first album, Talk, in 81, Manila in 82, I know you've gone on record as saying that, you know, you'd be happy if uh, those albums all uh, completely disappeared. What's the, the thought behind that? You're not happy with the sound? Oh, I don't very don't really much. I don't, I don't like <laughs> where do I start. Yeah. I don't like the songs. I don't like the singing. Um, yeah, it's just not really about the sound so much. Oh, that's, I don't, don't think the songs were, were, were good then, and the singing can't can't bear to hear my singing. Really? Um, so I was just learning how to write songs and be in yeah. a band. Um, so um, yeah. So th- those that you know, I know, I know there's you know some people aren't happy about that. That. Some of the people who played in those bands saying, you know, you've deleted those records. No. They were released. Yep. They didn't do much. Yep. They were they were out in the world for 16 years. Yep. And then when I got control of my catalogue, I said, I don't want, I don't want to. Yeah. Why, why, it's like putting out yeah. early first drafts of novels. Why, what, I saw no reason to, to keep putting it out there. No. They had their time. Yeah. But enough yeah. enough. Enough's enough. Those dots gigs and and you were playing, you know, you were playing three and four nights a week, weren't you? It was a a, a strong breeding ground for you. Did you love doing those gigs? Did you plan those gigs? We used to. What what were you thinking about performance at that time? Oh, it was, it was trying to make you know it was trying to make a living, and yep. you know, it was a, again it was a lucky time to be in Melbourne. There was lots and lots of. Pub gigs, yep, and the outer suburbs ones, you know, the Village Green, Sandringham, um, Ferntree Gully, um, Bombay Rock. So there were lots and lots of places to play. So you could play, you know, five five nights a week. Yeah, looking back, it was really good, good training. Just just yes. being able to play. You were aware of the shape of a set, and you were aware of the songs that connected. Yeah, that was how you. I learned. You start learning all that stuff about how to how to make a show, how to build a show, and how to give it its its ups and downs. Yeah, but I think um, became that sort of developed also a lot later 
probably when I got into a position where I could um, do shows where you when, do, do a show where the audience where you know the audience has come to listen to you. Yes. A lot of those early shows, we were just the band playing. So it was a different thing. It was just like we just got to smash it out, I guess. And then, you know, when going and playing on with the, the Colour Girls then became the Messengers and then we developed an ethos. We put up a lot, a lot of songs. And for many years we, we played, uh, we didn't have a set list. So it was sort of almost anti, you know, um, shaping the show. It would just, I would just call it because we thought, you know, we, we thought that was more exciting to do it that way, less predictable. Um, who but, who so, you'd call them? I'll call the songs. Yeah. So, but that's, but that in a way that was like making a shape of a show sort of in the moment on your feet rather than doing a set list. So, yeah, we, we were sort of well known as being this band that played without a set list for yes. a while. See, I wouldn't do that now. I would probably distract myself thinking, uh, well, what am I going to play next while I'm playing one song? But maybe my, my brain was younger then and more could more flexible could do that. Like we'll just play a song and then get the feeling towards the end of that song what's going to come next. Do you love performing? Yeah, yeah. Just I'm interested in in the idea of performance as it relates to you as a person, I suppose. Touring and performing, I couldn't do it all, all the time. All the, the, what goes with performing is touring and being away from home. So you've got a lot to try and get the right balance between performing and just being at home and writing and, and reading because, you know, I would I see myself as a, a writer before I'm a performer. Um, really? But I became a performer because I wrote songs. Yes. Um, and then, you know, found, yeah, I do find singing and performing one, it's interesting and also it feels great. I love uh, um, just being taken over. I guess that's what it is when you're, you're, you're not quite, you're not yourself anymore so you, you sort of break the boundaries of yourself, even solo. You just, okay, there's this, I'm this song that's now, I'm playing it but it's also, it's moving through me. Um, and then the other thing playing with the band is just, you know, our, again, our, our great friend James Black James has summed, Black. summed it up best with the, the phrase, the great oceanic, oceanic. feeling, the great oceanic feeling, which on a good night with the band when you, you're just you're making this beautiful noise together that none of you could have done on your own. And that's, you know, that's, that's, like, that's like being in church, you know, that's sort of or why, why people, you know, became, join choirs or what you know why they play sport they become something you're joining with other people to make something greater than yourself communion yeah so that's that's what I, I love yeah yeah and when you you know at, and getting better at it as you get older and having a band that's become that's become family which which my band is now it's like a, a, a you know a squad There's people move in and out a little bit but um, it's it's uh, old. There's you know shorthand languages. We just know we know each other without having to say things a lot. And yep. so we had playing together is um, you know some nights are transcendent. Some nights are just you just oh, that was a good gig. But our, our our bar is you know we don't we sort of we have a high bar now. So even a sort of what we thought was just an average gig is still a good gig. Yeah. Well, let's jump back. That was beautiful. Um, Adelaide to Melbourne was exciting. In about 1984, you went to Sydney. Hmm. How about that transition? So I moved up to, to um, Sydney in 84, lived there for six years. And I, just, I just started playing with Michael Barclay and Steve Connolly. I met Steve Connolly not, not long before. Um, I Down met, here yeah. in Melbourne. Yeah. I met Steve Connolly and Spencer Jones on the same night. They were playing in a band called The Cuban Heels. That's right. And my friend Ronnie Reinhardt, a uh, filmmaker, who took me to, to meet, meet them. Um, 
and uh, and Steve and I um, started playing together just around kitchen tables. Um, and that's when the songs from Post sort of started forming. And then with the family reasons, I moved to Sydney. And then Steve and Michael sort of came along a m- month or two later and we we got a flat together. So we were living together in a flat in, in uh, first in Coogee, then in Ramwick. Early in 1985, we, Steve and I got a, a residency in the Townsville International through a friend who was working up there. That's right. And that was that was that was playing four nights a week, three three or four sets, you know. So we played a lot of covers, and that's also playing, developing the songs for Post, playing some of those songs. So that's a good grounding. Playing yeah. what three nights a week? No, four or five nights a week. Three, three sets three, a night. Yeah, three sets a night. Like the um, what are they? What's Just in the, the bar, and again, playing to people that weren't there to, you know, they weren't there to listen to us. It was just music in the bar. And then back to Sydney and I wanted to ask you about a couple of people, Don Walker and Paul Hewson. They were, they were big influences leading up to Post. Oh, very much so, yeah. So when I first arrived in Sydney, um, uh, Don put me up at his place. So I stayed there for a, a few months. Yep. Still got, still got a place. And then um, we, you know, wrote a few songs there. Yep. Uh, I remember writing from St Kilda the King's Cross on his piano. And I remember playing him a song maybe a couple of years before, you know, earlier and uh, I can't remember what the song was but he he just said, keep writing. And he, you know, Don was like, yes, man a few words. Of course. The Clint Eastwood of rock. Yeah. <laughs> he just said, keep writing. So, you know, it was the best advice you could get, I could get. So I kept writing, and then he, he, I remember him saying something like, "Oh, you've got when he heard something from St Kilda the King's Cross or one of those ones that I would have played him." He said, oh, "You've got, you've got your own thing now." Uh, Great. I got the, you know, I got the stamp the of imp- approval, imprimatur, imprimatur, yeah, from Don. And what about Paul Hewson? Where did he fit in? Paul Hewson m- moved into a flat. Yep. in... Uh, Elizabeth Bay needed a flatmate. Yeah. And I, you know, that time Dragon were around playing. No, you know, I went, went to see them. Um, they were awesome band to watch. That's exciting. Mark Hunter up front. Yeah. You know, just that was yep. a performer, you know, yep. dangerous, and pushing the edge, pushing, you know. Yep. But these incredible songs. Yep. Written, you know, the, the big hits, mainly written by Paul Hewson. So. Yeah, because he wrote Rain. April Sun, perhaps. April Sun, are you old enough? Um, and are you seeing bands? You know, you talked about Melbourne being a hotbed of, of great bands. Did did Sydney have a scene that you, you were drawn to as well? Or were you more writing yourself? No, there were lots of bands, you know, bands playing at, uh, at the Hopeton and then the at Mansell the, Room. The Mansell Room. I remember also that Sydney was seeing. Uh, must have been the go, you know the go between to come back from England. They were around for a while. You see, yep. Oh, it died pretty. That was going, yeah. Yes. So it's, it's all coming back to me now. <laughs> Used to see them a lot. Lived, they were playing down bands playing at the trade union club down the road from where I lived in. Yeah. When I moved, when I moved to Surrey Hills, and so yeah. Used to see died pretty a lot. And yeah. again, it was that was sort of what I liked in a band. They were you never knew, knew. one night they were great great. Next night, they, you know, they were pretty awful. They yeah. Fall in the heat. But that's I, I like those kind of bands where you, you never quite knew what was going to happen next. Yeah. Who the gurus? Just, just go and see them. So yeah, it was a pretty pretty exciting time. And post was a, a you know a, a landmark record for you. What do you feel when you look back at that one? Well, I consider that my first record. Yeah, that's just, you know, and those other ones that. Two before it were sort of like working out how drafts, to, yeah, <laughs> drafts. Like so, but <laughs> you know, um, just le- learning how to sing yeah. and make records and write songs. So that was the first time I felt, you know, I've got something here that no one else is particularly doing. Yeah. So that's that was sort of the, the start for me, and then yeah. it was that record came out early '85, and at, at that time, we, you know. 
So the record came out and then I think... I'm trying to think of the timeline of being in Townsville. Well, it's Townsville where I met um, John Schofield because he was playing with the Chinless Elite, which was... um, (laughs) That's a great name. Jeremy Oxley's band after the Sunny Boys. Of course, that's another band we used to go and see, the Sunny Boys. Yeah. um, And so we would hang out a bit there and then John ended up playing, you know, we ended up playing the band together for many years. Um, So we got back from... I think Townsville made that record post and then um, we didn't play much as a three-piece after post. We'd done a lot beforehand. But then with we had Steve and Michael and then John joined. And then Pedro on keys. And Pedro on keys. And that was and that was us. And then we and I was, you know, had a lot of songs built up and then we we made a double album. Gossip in 1986. So and that and that had uh, before too long was on that, and that was that started getting played on the radio. Yep. So then suddenly everything kicked up. That was this, you know, that was the big, yep, the big jump. And I can still remember driving down. We used to do a lot of driving down the Hume Highway from Melbourne to Sydney to play gigs. You know, big old Kingswood, and um, hearing that song on the radio in the car, and uh, with our suit of fed and our and uh, six packs of beer. This is how we used to power the drive. And those gigs were very, you know, as you said, you you really built up this great ethos, this great feeling between all of you. Do you did you, did the songs flow? Because really, gossip was eighty six, under the sun, so much water, comedy. It, it felt like you were on a pretty good streak there. Yeah, it was a streak, you know. Yeah. I think. I put out about a hundred songs in about five years, five or six years, with with that with that band. Were you tending to write the bulk of them by yourself, and then bring them to the band? Yeah, I wrote most of them by myself and brought them to the band. Some some might have started as jams, but I think that tends to happen a bit more, a bit later. Yep. Um, Darling at Hertz was written with with Steve Connolly. You know, he was playing a riff and. Um, so there was a few co-writes in there, but I think most of them would have been just my songs that I would bring to the band. And again, they, uh, they you know, they were fully involved in the arrangements. So, so some of those songs now we still play. I mean, for many years we've played the old songs. I would find different ways to play them. Yes. Um, but then I sort of circled back, and you know, if you go and see us now, and we play something like "Before Too Long," we, we play. Steve Connolly's guitar part or um, um, Two Her Doors, Steve, Steve Connolly, you know. Dan wouldn't let me, my nephew Dan wouldn't let me play those songs any other way because he sort of grew up yes. learning guitar off those early records. He started guitar at 13 and he was, he'd learned all those Steve Connolly parts. So he knows a lot of those old songs better than I do. And he was the one that would push me. Said, "Let's just play it. That Steve, no, that is part of the song. What Steve plays, that is part of the song. Don't try and reinterpret the song." So he influenced brilliant thinking in that way. And then there's Spencer, you know, with Spencer, Spencer Jones, who played the riff on Gravy, played a very, a very distinctive guitar figure in say Midnight Rain. Yep. And there's other songs. So when I do a show now, and when those songs come up. It's like having, you know, you know, as you know, they both left us, but they're with us because they're. It's something I really like about that, like carrying my old, my old friends around with me, people who've been part of the, made the records that we played with along the way, that are now, in the songs. And when we play the songs, where they they're with us, so that's that's one reason for like we like to play. There's, I mean, there's no other way to play gravy for us than to have that riff. The Spencer riff. It's the Spencer riff, which Ash Naylor plays now. I noticed that at maybe the last bowl show, you actually made a point of mentioning the people and you, I think you used that phrase, we carry them with us. I thought it was really beautiful and, and great respect because there is the Steve Connolly and there's Morris Frawley yeah. and the Spencer and that's what 
life is, isn't it? Yeah, I've been, I have been talking about, you know, talking about that more on stage. I think it's, you know, especially as time goes past and um, the songs go further and further back and I think a lot of people who come to the shows, they just know the songs and if you, it's, it's good to be able to tell a story about the song and say, well, these, this, it's not just us up here, you know, but there's a whole... There's a whole host of others who've been on this road with us and so it's just a shout-out. It's beautiful. Let's, uh, let's leave Australia and let's go overseas. Was Gossip released in America? Yes. They, they, we went with a and Records and cut it down to 15 song records, so a single album. And, and was that something that... Was uh, exciting to you the idea of 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 being released in America and then perhaps playing? Oh, really exciting! That's yeah, I can yeah vividly vividly remember the first tour, uh, you know, going over there with with gossip and and the band and um, you know, everywhere you went, there was a every place you went that brought to mind a a song, a song or a movie or a TV show. And, yeah. Um, and uh, and just you know being together on the bus and it was all it was all new to us you know being being on a tour bus that was where you sleep on the bus and yeah very very exciting times and and what sort of rooms are you playing like are you playing to a hundred people to three hundred people yeah it's between hundred to three hundred to five hundred also one tour a very early tour we did supporting crowded house. So we were playing what they called soft soft theatres, and they were like two thousands. They were theatre oh, shows. So okay. we were the opening band with Crowded House. Then I'd get up with them and sing Leaps and Bounds. So um, that was a really great tour because you know they, they were we became friends with them as well. So when you you're travelling there, are the records out? Like, does the audience know the material? In a way, it's like going back to those early days, isn't it? Yeah, we had, you know, the first few years we were getting, you know, college radio, so, um, uh, and scattered radio play. We put, we never really like sort of had big hits in America, but just just pockets, I guess. Yeah. And it's never really gone beyond, you know, playing club shows or, you know, festivals sometimes. But, you know, we st- we go over there and play. It's still, you know, like club shows of a few hundred people. Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of. And, and America rather than England? Because they have been tours. Oh, England as well. Yeah. yeah. But probably played America more. And England and Europe, it's been a bit sort of haphazard and scattered but fairly regular to the UK. And and you lived in LA for a while? I had a few stints there um, at the end of uh, 88, 89. was there for a few months um, and that's when we made... Uh, so much, uh, so much water, so much yes. water, so close to home. The, yeah. the record, yeah, yeah, everything, everything's there from the song. Um, we'd done a tour which finished late in '88. Then we were scheduled to record with Scott Litt in uh, early in '89. So stayed on the family, and then we 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 recorded at Sunset Sunset Sounds in uh, LA with Scott Litt. Made that record. So that was a few months there. 92, 93, spent about six to nine months there as well. Um, to get going in America, I thought it, was, it would be better to just, you know, go in there and live there for to a while. To be there. So we did that. Um, and then there was another period, 94, 95, another few months there. So I've, I've had diff- different, you know, been there quite a lot. Yes. And did you find living there seeped into the recording and, and, and indeed the songwriting? Uh, well, you know, living there, I met um, Randy Jacobs, who was who you know became uh, we we started playing a lot as a duo. He yep. also recorded uh, on um, the album "Wanted Man," which was half of it was done in Australia and half in America. So, um, you know, playing with him was great. He had a he had a, a different kind of sound. Yeah, and, uh, a bit more funk, perhaps. Oh yeah, very sort of. Clean, funky, sort of, very. But you know, sort of 
sort of very lyrical and yes. soulful. Um, and we Deeper Waters are co-write with Randy Jacobs. It was started started with a riff that he had. And, okay, uh, wrote the song around that. So, really? Yeah. So we've got a couple of co-writes. I've been a fool. Was I think is another one that yep. we wrote together. And I know there was a co-write with John Clifford, our, our mutual. Yeah, friend. he was living there around that, around that time that I was there. Renee Gay was also living in the states, and that's I got our friendship developed over there as well. And that's you know started writing when I wrote Difficult Woman for her and started writing songs more for her. Well, this is probably a good time to move into one of these areas that that I wanted to get to the, the collaborations. It's it's really been a very strong aspect of your work, uh, and maybe we'll, I'll just throw a few names at you, and and hear your your memories and and what those artists have brought to your work. Let's start with Renee, the difficult woman. Um, I'd seen Renee for the first time at Kinsella's in Sydney, and it's, it was a very theatrical, almost like a cabaret show. Very again, very sort of stylized, designed, and scripted, and I, I loved it. Um, this must have been when I was living in Sydney between eighty four and ninety, because she was there as well then. And someone we made contact and talked about, you know, maybe you know, writing a song for her. Um, although she thought my music was completely different to hers. <laughs> Then um, Martin Armiger was musical director of a TV series called The Seven Deadly Sins yes. which, and he was doing the music for it. And uh, he, Renee, he had Renee as a singer, Deborah Conway, Vicar and Linda and he asked me to maybe be involved, do something, maybe write something. And I'd just written a song called Foggy Highway which I, th- I thought loosely, you know, would fit in with the theme of the series. Each episode was a different sin. Yes. So this is Foggy High, you know, it's someone lost, someone's lost their way in life. They don't know where, can't, trying to find their way home. Yep. And I think I, I think I suggested maybe try Renee singing it and Martin played it to her and she's, if you know Renee, you can, you can imagine this, she's, no, nah, completely dismissed it. No, you know, that's nothing like what I do. I wasn't there. This is Martin telling me later. And then Martin sort of sort of coaxed her into it. So just give it a try. They turned the lights down low. And and they had, you know, the very minimal just a, the bass, very minimal guitar and, and brush drums. And she sang the song. And she just and then they, they sent me the recording and the hairs rose, rose up on the back of my neck. And uh, for her, it was like, ah, oh, she discovered something as well. Like, I can do this. I mean, she made it totally yes. her own. Made, she made it a soul song. But she, I think it was uh, a, a bit of a um, unlock, un- unlocked a key for her to, to try out stuff outside of what she might think her repertoire. Yep. And also for me, I said, wow, here's someone. I can write, you know, write for. Because I was, you know, before that I'd written songs like The Sweet Guy, yep. you know, and I'd... From the perspective. And I was writing songs from... Because, I'm, you know, I came out of folk music which always used, writes from the point of view of where well, the singer's not the song. Yes. So that's... I always came from that. And so, you know, folk music people write as... Well, they write as, you know, moles in the ground or as a ghost or, um, you know... There's there's a lot of fluidity in no folk, rules. folk music, which which rock music doesn't have or didn't have, and um, so I was writing songs from the point of view of women because that's just the way that songs would come. You know, songs come from things people say or conversations. So obviously, there's certain things that, that will been have been said to me by women. So, well, there's a song, so I'd write the song. Yeah, even when it might you might seem it's. I'm very much like that character in that song. It's <laughs> fiction. Once you start, yeah, you change one little thing, you yeah. change the whole thing for the sake of the story. But so. um, I'd written "Sweet Guy" and uh, and well, I was I was trying to get other women singers around Sydney to sing it, so I passed it round, but no one sort of 
bit. Uh, and again, Steve Connolly said, it was Steve Connolly said, you can sing it, we can sing it. Because they liked the song and he made a great riff up. Said, yeah. Sing it, sing it yourself, you know. Then he, he, he cited Joan Baez. Joan Baez sang the night they drove old Dixie down, you can sing this song. And I, I can still remember playing that song for the first time. It was, I think it was at Woi Woi Leagues Club, you know, <laughs> playing What Makes Such a Sweet Guy Turn So Mean. And um, and thinking, yeah, it's going to work. Um, we just played and played the set. People, it was, you know, again, you know, we, people on the dance floor. Yep. Song played. The earth didn't fall over. Nah. Um, people kept dancing. Um, and so, and then it felt really weird to me at first. Even though I come from folk music, just sort of in this context, playing a, a rock and roll song. Yes. Um, but then it got became easy. So I, you know, I started, you know, not worrying about yep. um, the point of view of the song. Yeah. But of course, I was always trying to, to get uh, women to sing these songs. And then so when Renee came along and sang that song, I thought, great, here we go. And um, so I ended up writing. Uh, when a woman loves a man, you know, for, with Renee in mind, um, you broke a beautiful thing. Was was really that was with Renee in mind. Yeah. So, and then she would also she started looking at my songs and seeing what she could do. And she, I write difficult woman with Renee. In mind. Of course, that was that really got us going. That was specifically about her. Yes. For her to sing. Couple of other collaborators, uh, Archie Roach. Uh, you wrote Rally Around the Drum. With him, but I, I'm I'm keen to hear your story because I've heard it from Archie of your first meeting, and and I was in uh, Hamer Hall that night. Yeah, that yeah, you were there. Yeah. I was there again. Steve, Steve Connolly keeps coming up again. Steve Connolly came to me one day and said, "I've just seen this great singer and heard this great song by a guy called Archie Roach on a show called Blackout," and um, and we were coming up to do show at Hamer Hall um, and this was a big deal for us. We we hadn't sort of done a show like, you know, it was sort of like a big deal. Like, yeah. oh, we're, we're adults now. We're playing at Hamer Hall, you know. So uh, we wanted to do, um, have it, you know, make a special show and, and get a really interesting opening act. And Steve said, why don't we see if we can get Archie to come and play? And uh, we tracked him down and he got booked. We hadn't met him, but it, so the first night I met him was the night of the concert, and uh, I saw him briefly before the show and just checked in on him, see if he was okay, had everything he needed, and later I found out that he thought I was one of the security guys, um, <laughs> and then he went and did his performance. Uh, I think it was just two songs, two long songs. The last one was. They took the children away because he only had 20 minutes. Uh, and they did, finished, they took the children away. His last song and there was dead silence and he thought he'd, he'd bombed. So he just sort of turned and walked off stage. And as he walked off, I, I was watching from the side, the, uh, you could feel the applause just building and building and building. The audience had been sort of stunned by the song. And this applause just started building. I don't know if this is your memory. Yeah. But again, I got the hairs on the back of my neck. Yep. And then the way we'd set up the show was that we he would finish because he was just, you know, one one person in a mic. We could, we could walk on as a band and go straight into our set. It wasn't, it wasn't an interval situation. So Archie walked off and we walked on. And by the time we got off stage, he'd gone <sighs> into the night. So that was my first meeting with Archie. But then, so is that your memory of that of that show? Absolutely. Martin Flanagan was there too, and, and wrote about it. Yep. Um, well, we were, we didn't know who he was, but he was clearly uh, someone with a, a strong voice and a strong presence. But when we heard "Took the Children Away," it was it was gobsmacking, as mm. James Black likes to say. Mm. It was stunning, and we felt. Shame, collective shame, and and a, a degree of guilt and horror. It was remarkable. Mm. Yeah. And so you ended up. Steve produced his first album. Yeah. So we track all lane. We, we, yeah, we tracked him. But down. you were part of that. Oh yeah, yeah. So we tra we tracked um, 
actually down and then Steve and I started going out to, they were living in Thornbury. We, we started going out there and just sitting around the kitchen table singing songs with Archie, Ruby and their kids and foster kids, lots of ham sandwiches and big cups of, big pots of tea. And... Um, with a view to recording? Yeah, or? with a view yeah, the view to, to making a record. But we sort of, I guess we, we eased into it by playing um, other people's songs. He, you know, he, he played Their Sands of Glass by... Um, who was a street singer? LA street singer that was Ted Hawkins. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he knew quite a few of Ted's yeah. songs and obviously Hank Williams, a lot of country songs. So we, we were playing George Jones and we were playing those songs around the table and then playing, I'll play a song of mine and Archie would play a song of his. And then, and then we soon discovered that Archie had heaps and heaps of songs. And Ruby was sort of always reminding him, saying, oh, look, you know, it was Ruby reminded him about saying, oh, play that song Charcoal Lane. So Archie plays Charcoal Lane and I, and had Steve and I, had George just dropped to the floor. It's like, yes. Well, that was the thing that was so striking with Archie's song. He'd been around a long time playing playing in the folk clubs, writing for, for a long time, and he had this strong body of work that was already, it didn't need, you know, didn't need developing. No. He just, just needed recording. Yes. So that was our sort of ethos when we went to record him at Greg Ham's studio in Carlton. Yep. And uh, and um, and Steve was in charge. And it was it was I know it was tough for Archie because we were we were sort of working in the in the eighties style of production where you do things one at a time and you have yep. a click track and you do a guitar and do the vocal. So I know that that was pretty weird for him. Yes. Um, but uh, we slowly work, worked on it and we also, I wanted to make sure that the album got some notice so, you know, pulled in pulled in well-known singers and musicians to help. So Vicar and Linda sang on a track. Um, Neil Finn came and sang it. It's his high part on. They took the children away. James Black came in. Andrew Duffield from The Models, Models. Played, it, played on a track. My sister Mary Jo played piano. So we, we just brought in a few people around uh, uh, Archie's songs and vocals. But yep. really we kept, kept the record as very sparse. And Down City Streets. And that was a Ruby A Ruby, Ruby song. song. Yeah. So, yeah, again, it's sort of at the end of weeks and weeks of sitting around the kitchen table, yeah, Ruby pipes up and says, you know, Archie's not the only one that writes songs around here. <laughs> and then she played Down City Streets. And that was oh. said. said you should do that one, yeah. And that was, and so that was our tenth song. We needed to so we're yeah. going to get ten songs. Yeah, right. And so you've uh, cultivated a, a, a really beautiful relationship with Archie uh, and you wrote Rally Around the Drum together. Have you written other songs with Archie or just that one? I think just that one. Yeah. I mean there might have been some attempts at never turned into anything but rallied around the drum. That was pretty, not long after, it was during our first tour, his first tour after the record came out. Yeah. We toured together. Yeah. And he was, I remember we were in a hotel room in Perth and he was talking about his days as a temp boxer and then started writing the song from there. Um, and then I, I was sort of, sort of became a song in my repertoire. He never really, he, he didn't really do it himself for a while and then he sort of came back to it years later. And then um, he did a beautiful recording of it with um, Paul Grabowski. Yes. And, um, so it's sort of part of part of his set now. Yeah. And what about Kev? Kev Carmody. That's a that's a beautiful relationship. Yeah, that's a long one. That goes back a long way too. That's uh, again from living in Sydney between eighty four and nineteen ninety, and Kev was around living in Marrickville. There's a lots of the there were lots of Rock Against Racism concerts, and Rock for Land Rights, yeah. um, the Building Bridges album, all that was going on. That's so right. I met, just met Kevin at one of these gigs. It's, that's the first time I saw him play. It's just after Pillars of Society had come out. It was his first album, you know. Uh, incredible. He was, again, this incredible presence on stage and spitting his words out, and, you know, just like... Uh, very dangerous but very lyrical, you know. Cannot buy my soul. You know. 
thou shalt not steal. Um, so, yeah, that was, again, the friendship just developed from there and we just used to go and visit each other's houses and play music together and play songs. And, again, Kev, Kev was in his 40s then, so he'd had he'd been writing songs for ages too. So um, once again, Steve Connolly, we got involved and we have sort of became... Kev's band for his second album, which was Eulogy for a Black Person. So Steve produced that. Uh, I played a bit of guitar and harmonica. And, um, that had songs like Ellie and uh, Driving Woman. Um, and so where did... And then from then, yeah, when the, that, around that time, um, so Kev must have moved back to Queensland by then. And invited me on a you know, to go on a camping trip. So my son Declan, who was I think eight, yep. we went we went with Kev to Wyvernhoe Dam and uh, camped camped on the on the shore. And then um, we wrote from little from little things, big things grow around the campfire. Um, again, from I had the title just floating around as which I thought would be maybe a soul song, a sort of a bit like a, you know, it's growing like The Temptations or yeah. some kind of love song. Yeah. From little things, big things grow. But he started, we were talking about the the, the strike, the Gurindji strike, um, and the long, long time it took from um, leaving Vesti Station to, to getting their land back. And that's, and then I thought, aha, uh-huh, this title's going to work with this story. Yeah. So we started it straight away there. Um, we didn't finish it there. We both were a little bit hazy on all the facts later on because it was an eight, you know, eight-year-long story. So um, then I read The Unlucky Australians by Frank Hardy, which tells that story from Frank's point of view and sort of filled in the gaps. And then Kevin and I finished finish it off over the phone, the rest of the lyrics. We had the tune and the melody and some of the verses, so we were, it was mostly written at Wyvern Hodan and then finished off later. So that's a big song for you too, isn't it? Yeah, that's just a, that so, one of those funny old songs that just keeps creaking along. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, but the different versions, you know, the Get Up Mob. The Get Up Mob did it, yeah, with um, Tim. That was the first time I've worked with Tim Levinson. Yeah. You heard. Um, and we've, you know, we've developed a friendship and a working relationship since then. Missy Higgins sang on that. Yes. Um there's been lots of you know we always get, always getting sent versions from people who might have changed the words but they're using it for some thing something at their school or schools some uh, community event or some political campaign. Yep, it's been used by uh, independent politicians. Um, yeah, it just keeps keeps going. And there's been lots of different versions over the years. And you're no stranger to to singing about. Um you know, the First Nations people uh, and a sense of injustice. I mean, you look at Maralinga, Off Gossip, uh, Bicentennial was the, the flip side to to her door. So, you know, people do, I suppose, associate you with that. I wanted to ask you about the, the idea of the sort of the the politically motivated song or the... Protest is a is a sort of word that's thrown around a lot. Do you think songs can can make a difference? Oh, I think they can make a difference, but I think you you know probably um, in small ways or um, in hidden ways or ways you may not be aware of. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, I, I wouldn't sort of over. Uh, estimate that they can, you know, that songs can be really powerful, but I wouldn't underestimate them either. They, they, they just, they often just they're out of your hands and, and they do their work. It seems that I've written, collaborated a lot with Abor- Aboriginal musicians over the years, and that's mainly through not even a um, sort of a conscious effort, but more just um, being given chances, being invited places, uh, and you know. Being curious, I guess, um, 
Maralinga was a pretty early song that came out that was, you know, I read about it in the newspaper, the old National Times and re reading about the Royal Commission into the Maralinga Tess. And I wrote that song and then, that, you know, led me later on to get to meet Yami Lester, who's the protagonist of that song, yep. one of them. Um, meeting Yothi Yindi in, in um, Chicago when they were touring with Midnight Oil in the early 90s. And we, were, we were on the road as well and we had a night off in Chicago and went and see Midnight Oil. And, I th that's the first time I saw Yothi Indy, and that like that was amazing. You know, yeah. like, you know what it was, and, and you could, you know, the, the American audience was like, yeah, you know. what did they think of it? Uh, well, I mean, it was uh, they were all there, for, they were there for me not all, but there was this band. You know, they were. It was was it a band? Was it a dance? Was it dance? What it was? It was it was some some of the band were in you know <laughs> traditional. Um, Traditional dress and painted, yes, and with ochre, and then but Munda boys just sort of in jeans and a headscarf, and there's there's white fellas and black fellas, so yeah. they were, were they would have been doing their first album, I think, yeah. which is sort of rock songs, and then um, um, traditional songs, yeah. But then from that, um, uh, I got asked to go and help them. Uh, produce the next. They're working on their second record. Right. And that was when I got involved um, with Peter Garrett. Yeah, Peter, yeah. Peter Garrett sort of was a bit further down the line from that. So I, I, I got asked up to Yokala, which is where um, Uni Pingu is from, and um, and the band was from, and they he he was keen to start mixing the rock. And the traditional stuff together, so he re was really keen to get the synth synthesis going. Uh, I brought up Ray Ferreira, who's percussionist. Yeah. So, so we worked on incorporating English language and Yungo language into the songs together and melodies. So that was really how that record came about. That was uh, their second record, Tribal Voice. Treaties on that, um, but. The, the single treaty, the, the song, the single, the hit, it was a kind of a very secu circuitous yes. journey. So the, we wrote, um, Mundawai and I had written a song around the campfire. We'd written, we started writing, but we, we were so, um, we wrote songs completely differently. He was more like, he was a teacher. He, he's, he wanted to sit, write songs with a message and a philosophy. And yes. uh, that's that's how he wrote songs. Whereas I was like, I don't know what the song is until I start. I start with you know some a detail or yeah. a visual image, and then so I'm I'm more from bottom up. He was more from top down. Yeah, and we were trying to write together, and we got stuck. We wrote one you know one and a half verses of this song, and it had a bit of a melody, and then didn't have a chorus. So I just I just started singing. Um, treaty, treaty, yeah, treaty. Now that was that was sort of I will we'll do something later on with that. Oh, so it's the, a placeholder. It was a placeholder, and then uh, so that was mainly me, me and Mundawai and a uh, few other people around there. Just we were camping in a place called Brin Brin, which is down from Yukala. And then uh, young young Doctor G was there too, um, very young, not in the band yet. I mean, a teenager. Then we went up to um, Dr. G Unipingu. Yeah. Um, and then we went up to uh, Darwin with the rest of the band and we'd been working with it. You know, we've, other songs that are more fully formed that um, uh, M Unipingu, other Dr. Unipingu had written, uh, the, leader of the, the leader of Yothi Yindi. And he... Uh, um, so, he, yeah, he'd had... But he had more complete songs. So the, the sort of the incomplete song was, was Treaty. And we rehearsed all the other songs and, and it started to get that fusion happening that we were all aiming for, yep. of getting the two styles mixed together. And then the, the last day we, we started mucking around with Treaty and the band got a bit of a groove. And then I, that, I think that's when I started singing the Treaty, yeah. <laughs> but then we ran out of time. So it was unfinished. <laughs> then they came down to record their record and then their manager, AJ, who was a friend of mine, Alan James, rings up and says, they're doing, they've, they've recorded this song, Treaty, and Mushroom 
you know, like it, but he's he's mumbling the word that you can't don't know what the words is. He's he's mumbling. <laughs> He's mumbling the words. The words are unclear. He says, oh, that, maybe that's because we, we never finished the words. And I said, I said, and I said what, you know, what, what, about a, what, what, what about the chorus? What about the rest of the song? He says, oh, the chorus is treaty, yeah, treaty now. It's great. Um, so then by that time they were, they'd gone, must have been doing a gig, gig in Sydney and they were in the hotel room in Glebe. And Alan said to me, can you come up and just finish that song? <laughs> So I went to Glee, went to this hotel room, we sat out on the balcony and we finished off the rest of the words. And then we went down to see Pete Garrett, who was in the midnight all offices around the corner. Right. And I think we just played it to him. And uh, uh, sort of like the, sort of like getting the, the, the nod of approval. Yeah. And then I had to go home. Then they went to the studio the next day to record it and Pete Garrett came to the studio and he... Came up with the answering backing vocals. You know, um, if you hear the original version, the original version, which was quite different to the the hit version, the filthy. So maker. yeah, yeah. So, Mun, yeah. So I keep trying to say his name, but I won't. But you know, who I'm talking. About. Yes. Uh, he he got so he had me on the song as a writer and Pete Garrett on the song as a writer. So very, you know, he's from a political family. Yeah, uh, and that was he was always you know he, he said I want to when when I first came up to work on the album he said I want to write this song this tr- I want to sort of write a song about the treaty about a treaty with you I want to write it with you I want to write you know I want it to be Ballander you know, um I want it to be collaboration yep a lot of his talk and his philosophy was about balance two sides Dur- you know uh, uh, you are the the the, the different um, um, skin systems, fresh water, salt water, the band itself, Yossi Yindi, mother, child, you know, it was everything. There was yes. always these um, balance. That was the word he used the most, balance. Uh, yeah, he wanted to have that balance in the song. Um, so then, it, you know, it was recorded, it came out, Triple J played it a bit. It wasn't, wasn't a big hit or anything. It was sort of a more of a rock funk version. Yeah. And then, then, then Mushroom got uh, um, Robert, Robert Gooch. Robert Gooch, um, um, can't remember the, the name is catchy right now. Um, Filthy Luca, they remixed it, and um, they was pretty pretty much like just like stripping an engine. And yeah, what did you think? They broke you... it down and they and then they put back a few parts and added some things, and then oh, well, I I, love, I remember going into Mushroom. Oh, the mushroom officers sitting around the boardroom and they, they said, we've got this remix, can we play it to you? And they were filthy, the filthy Luca guys were look, looking very, very nervous. They played it to me and I, I loved it. I said, that's a, it, sounds like a hit to me. It's a hit. Great. Uh, they st- stripped out nearly all the words um, and which, fine, it's a remix. That, so that that was the hit. You know, they, they deserve so much of the credit. For that, so it was one of those songs that many many langs on, yeah, of hands, yeah, and what a what a, an incredible incredible result. You mentioned before, Paul, that you do have a, a, a curious nature. You, you want to understand. You want to explore. You won't be tied down. And and so there's been some great little excursions into into dub into reggae. The one that I really love too is the sort of the bluegrass excursion, uh, Smoke with Uncle Bill yeah. and the Foggy Highway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Tell us about those uh, those moments, those recordings. Uh, well, I, you know, I loved bluegrass music for a long time and fairly early on once I discovered, you know, going back when I first discovered, you know, Graham Parsons and... Um, and then Bob Dylan, um, Neil Young, around that time when I first started playing guitar. Then reading um, Dylan biography and learning a lot about, you know, different kinds of American music going further back. Back, you know, that's when I first, you know, found it, discovered Howling Wolf and Robert Johnson and Muddy Waters. And, yeah. and then, you know, the 
bands like the Leuven Brothers and the Stanley Brothers. So, yes, I only can remember, have a vivid memory of hearing the Stanley Brothers for the first time and sort of, again, thinking, what is this sort of weird, this kind of high, strange, lonesome, lonesome, you know, but heavenly, but also, you know, hard scrabble music. Um, So, yeah, bluegrass is a, a big, a big thing. Or, you know, sort of way back for me, sort of part of, uh, I guess, and country music was always part of the DNA of my songwriting. Michael Barclay from The Messengers also loved loved bluegrass and and, and uh, country music. So uh, we shared that. So, yeah, bluegrass, always liked bluegrass. And then I, but I sort of, we weren't really playing that. We were playing, you know, electric guitars and stuff. But then... Um, it was late nineties, and I think probably underlying it was um, I had a um, a greatest hits come out. A greatest hits collection came out in nineteen ninety seven. Ninety seven, um, and and it sort of it sold a truckload, and you know we went to number two. But they, I think there was also this other sort of zeitgeist happening, whereas um, a lot of people said, "Oh, I know that guy. You know, I've heard of him. I know some of his songs, and I know he's made a lot of different records." And then suddenly, I think people thought, "Oh, I can get, you know, I can just get this one record." This Greatest thing. hits. Yeah, as we all do when we, you know, trying to, you know. Dig deep into an artist. We start yeah. with the greatest hits. Yeah. yeah. Again, I have to give credit to Michael Goodinsky for that greatest hits record because he badgered me about that for maybe four or five years, and I was always like, um, "I'm not looking back. I'm not looking back. I just got to make the next music." But if you know, he finally convinced me. So that's when I started trying to compile the list together. I chose them, but it was mainly chosen by you know what was popular yeah. and what was you know. So there's obviously songs that have actually been popular radio songs and then other songs that had got popular over time and that was, um, you know, From Little Things Be Things Grow it was never a radio song but it was you know, on there because of, it was sort of things that were popular at the, at the shows yeah. as well. And How to Make Grab was on the first one. I think that would just come out the year before. Uh, um, but what I'm saying is that so that sort of did really, really well, better than any of my other records had done. And it still sort of just ticks along, but um, uh, I think looking back, it, it sort of gave me some confidence. Yep. You know, sort of, um, and in a way that's probably um, confident enough to sort of say, well, I can I can do different kinds of records. So that's when uh, I did the, the bluegrass, the first bluegrass record, Smoke, and Professor Ratbaggy record. They came out. I actually convinced the record company to put them out on the same day because I said they're so opposite to each other that they won't they won't um, uh, compete. Because Professor Ratbaggy is sort of dub more da- your reggae. Dubby, yeah, not 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 too much reggae, but more yeah, more dub instrumental experimental yeah. dubby. And a great band, yeah. Lucky Peter Luscombe, yeah. Bruce Hames, yeah. Hadley. The Casuals. And they were just playing instrumentals, and lot the meters and all songs like that. And then I came along, you know, I'd love to go and see them play. And then I said, you know, maybe we should just, you know, try doing a, a record together with, with um, you know, writing grooves and, and, um, and making songs or pieces from that. So we started doing that, just getting to rehearsal room once a week. Um, someone bringing a bass line or a drum groove or a riff, and then we'll make these pieces and then I'd, I'd take, sometimes I'd take them in a little cassette player and take them home and walk around the neighbourhood trying to put lyrics to it. So they were, they were songs written from the bass and drums yes. and the groove up. And uh, at that time I already decided to do a bluegrass record and that came about because I'd heard this record by Tim O'Brien who'd done a whole album based, bluegrass album based on Dylan's songs. What's that called? Re- something on Blonde? Blonde on... Red on blonde. Red on blonde, because yeah. Tim's redheaded. So that was a spark that said, "Oh, I could do a bluegrass rec- record of my." There's enough songs of mine because it's such strong country roots in a lot of them. Yes. To do a bluegrass record, so I had that was the spark for that. I just started working towards that, 
And then um, I knew Uncle Bill who were playing around the place, so I really liked them. So we started rehearsing for that. And I can still remember rehearsing uh, with doing a, re you know, rehearsing with Rat Baggy or jamming with Rat Baggy and then <laughs> going off to a rehearsal straight after it too with uh, Uncle Bill. Uncle Bill. And, uh, and feeling like I just had to, you know, put a different hat on. And uh, Yeah, because bluegrass is quite uh, tight and the, the forms are quite strict. And, and it's quite, yeah, it's sort of so many sort of opposites in every way. We, there's no drums in bluegrass and we were sort of, the Rat Baggy was written from the bass and drums up. Yeah. Bluegrass was sung high. All the songs of mine that I took to Uncle Bill to do in bluegrass form, we all, all end up taking the key up. Right. To, just to make it get had that sound. Yeah. You know? So I was singing at a high register. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and you know, very, you know, very melodic harmonies. So, yeah, so all these different, they were so different to each other. Yeah. That's why I could say, say to the record company, they're different, they won't compete. And, and they, they agreed. They agreed. But, you know, they probably wouldn't have agreed unless I'd had this huge sort of songs from the South. The greatest hits. So I get the sense, you know, you talk about going to the Black Cat and seeing the casuals. You talk about seeing Uncle Bill. So you are someone who you, you, the, the ear is always open. You're listening and you're meeting people and, yeah, you are curious. That's a big part of, of you as a person. Yeah I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm curious and I like lots of different things. Uh, my music tastes are pretty wide um, and reading as well. So I, I, pretty eclectic. I like working with people who are the same way. Um, so, you know, the, the band at the moment, you know, which I've worked with on and off for over 20 years, Bill McDonald and Peter, Peter Lusk and Dan Kelly, uh, you know, Ash, Ash Naylor, Cam Bruce, the, the range of music that's listened to amongst you know, all of us is, is huge, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, from straight up very well-known pop music or British pop to experimental music to uh, yeah. ambient to deep deep uh, funk and soul stuff. Um, so, yeah, so the, the, I, I'm pretty eclectic like that. Um, yeah. I like this, I find all kinds of music pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Melbourne's a great music town so you, you can go and hear, hear all yeah. sorts of different bands. So that was there, yeah, that's definitely part of it. I mentioned poetry before and uh, in fact there's a, an album from maybe three or four years ago, Nature, which uh, you took some some really well-known poets, Dylan Thomas, Gerald Manley Hopkins. Philip Larkin. Philip Larkin. Sylvia Plath. Yeah, Sylvia Plath. Yeah. And then you released a, a, a collection a compendium, perhaps is that the word? Yeah, a book. A book oh, yeah. Like, yeah, let's call it a book. Yeah, of poetry. How much time do you spend reading poetry, and how did those poems uh, move into songs? Uh, well, I mean, I've always read poetry along with you know novels and non-fiction and history. So poetry's always been part of you know things things that I read. But there was a real this is a, probably another big turning point for me was when I worked with um, NAM, the Australian National Academy of Music, in 2012. They approached me and said, would you like to write a song cycle for our students with a modern classical composer? I'd just uh, come off of oh, the, written the book, The Mongrel Memoir, like How to Make Gravy, which came out in 2011, 2010. Yep. And that had taken a few years and I'd written, I'd hardly written a song in four or five years. And they asked me to do this song cycle with a classical composer. And I, I, it still sounded so far-fetched to me, I said yes. You know, that was sort of probably another um, little motto of mine is do the things that you know, you're a bit scared of. And then I realised, oh, I feel rusty. I feel rusty. How am I going to write a song, let alone, let alone, a, let alone a song cycle? you know, in the time that they wanted to do it. So that's when I thought maybe uh, start finding some poems and putting them to music. Uh, and I met James Ledger, the composer from Perth. We really sort of got on well and, he, you know, he was um, pretty experimental in what he did. And 
we we just started emailing ideas back and forth. The long sort of to, to cut a long story short, I, I realised I could put um, music to already existing words, whereas for most of my life I'd thought, or the way I'd written songs up to that point had been always a music first, or sort of singing a melody, or um, singing sounds, sometimes with some words, Nasser's words, maybe a line, maybe the title, a line here and there. But my, I never had written a set of words and then put a song to it. I always get the words from the melody or the music. And often songwriting for me will be just getting words to fit those sort of sounds I made. So I had this idea that you can't, you can't write the words first and do write a, a song because somehow you'd be too restricted. Yes. You'd be on too rigid a rail. That was just my sort of blind spot. But then did this work with James, we wrote the whole show of, of you know, other people's words put to music. And that sort of, uh, that was, you know, great fun to do and very exciting. And, and whose that, words? Uh, we had um, In Memoriam by Tennyson. We had a couple of Judith Wright poems. We had a Kenneth Slesser poem. After we'd, we'd done that show, I thought, well, if I can, you know, I can. It sort of opened, my, uh, opened up my uh, whole view of, um, oh, I can put songs, I can put, make melodies to anything. The next thing I did was I just put a melody, the Sonnet 18 by Shakespeare, and thought, well, that works. It just sounded like an old. Sound, sounded like an old bluegrass song. Yeah. So that then that led to doing a whole record of Shakespeare, and then so then it was sort of off and running with. So that that for me, this was in 2013, 14, very exciting because when you've been writing songs for 40 years, and then you find a new way to write songs. Yes. It's like wow, this is um, I've I've lucked out here. I can so it was sort of. I have another st- string to my bow, so then it's it's become part of the way I write songs now. Sometimes I I now and I will sometimes take some uh, a poem, someone's poem, and put it to music, and it's even got turned to the extent where I will now write a poem myself. So I will sometimes write a set of words and then put the music to it, which I always thought I couldn't do. You couldn't do. Yeah. So I found a new way to write songs, which is which is at, what, at at whatever what any writer. Once, of course, be able to find new ways to write songs. Yeah, and collaboration is part of that too. Is a, a way to write songs that, if you collaborate with someone, you'll write something that you couldn't have written by yourself. So that's also an, another way of opening up. Yeah. Let's go to a really recent project where you went up to Sydney, and you were part of the Vivid Festival. You did a, a set of songs loosely based on. Time. So, in, in a way, I think we might even look back on your time. What did you learn about putting together those songs? What did you learn about yourself, and what did you learn about your your work? Um, it's a, doing that show is sort of probably a continuation of things I've been doing over many years. You know, and I, I know you like to do it too, making mixtapes. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've done it, I used to do it with cassettes, make mix, cassette, mix tapes for friends and also for myself. I used to make lots and lots of mixtapes and they're like little capsules of what you listen to at a certain time. Yep. Um, and, and in recent years, uh, so with, when I've been working with my publishers for pitching songs, I would sort of, I would have started to put my songs into little themes or, you know, just so you can say, oh, here's a, you know, travelling, travelling a song, or regret or, um, you know, un, uh, unrequited love. So playing around with putting, um, it's sort of a bit nerdy, but, you know, play, playing around with putting songs into playlists. Yeah. So instead of doing it with a whole range of artists, it just, Doing it with my songs, and yeah. so I had enough, you know, three or four hundred or more songs to start doing that with. So that sort of came out of conversations with the publishers. So I was already sort of doing that anyway, and then Vivid 
approached me about doing a show and they said, and they said, can you do something, you know, not, can you do something, make us a sort of exclusive show, something special that you wouldn't do. So then I thought, well, um, I'll do it about time, you know, time and tide. I was also talking to the record company about as a, as a, to the idea of doing a seri series of these compilations around different themes and putting them out not just as playlists on streaming services like Spotify and so on, but just as actual physical records, even though, that, you know, that physical sales are going down. Decreasing. But it just, just to give it that sort of weight of something physical. It's not just a playlist. It's uh, a record. Yeah. And for me it was a way of um, uh, presenting songs that, that may tend to sort of get lost. Because there's, again, so, so many people just like, they, have, they just play songs from the South yeah. or they come to the shows and they want to hear well-known songs. But this is a way of saying, well, there's other songs yeah. in this theme and that might be a good way to, yeah. to hear it. So that we're starting a going to start rolling out the, a series of these every few months. Great. The next one is Rivers and Rain. That's already been done. It's in the works. Fantastic. So that's out in late July. Their um, families will be probably the one after that. Of course. Yeah. So, so doing the time thing, it, it felt in a way. And time. That's in, yeah. in time, yeah. So did you, you know, does it, does it make you look back? Are you someone that looks back on 40-odd years of, of, of playing? In the sense that I like to, to go, uh, go, go back and keep in touch with the songs, songs that I like, yep. play and play them. That was that, and again, that sort of started with the A to Z shows that I, I began in two thousand and five, which Damn. led to which led to the A to Z shows for hundred songs over four nights, uh, my songs, you know, yep. in alphabetical order. I remember the very first one was I had to sort of a lot of work just remembering them and learning them because some of them have just sort of fallen, fallen out of my head. Yeah. But now uh, did a series of A to Z shows over a few years, wrote the book, um, and uh, and then you know did you know, also also doing records based on reinterpreting songs. So it, I, I do consciously now try and make sure I don't. Forget my songs. Yes. So, yeah, so, so there's a at a certain point they, they're there forever. If you play them enough, they're there forever. So, um, I, I've got a lot now that I could just I could just play. I don't have yeah. to go and learn learn them again. Paul, we've talked about music in the house, through the siblings, through your piano teacher, the the brandy and the milk, uh, <laughs> but it was part of the grandparent story too. Uh, yeah, my. Grandparents on my mother's side, uh, her dad was an uh, Italian, Ercole, Filippini, and he married my nonna. We grew up, she was nonna, but she was uh, Anne McFarland, Anne, Anne McFarland, um, with Irish ancestry. And they they had met in the early, oh, in the late, you know, 1919 maybe or early 20s. And <clears throat> he came out to... Uh, Australia with a Spanish opera company called the Gonzalez Brothers that had been touring all, all around um, Asia, Southeast Asia. And um, it was during World War One. Anyway, they, he ended up staying in a, Australia and, be, and to teaching, you know, teaching singing. And my grandmother was one of his students and, you know, he was a famous story in the family of, um, he was teaching her a song called Ideale and uh, she was trying to sing it and he said, no, this is, this, you sing it like this, it's a love song. And then he sang it to her and that's when she knew that the teacher was, the maestro was falling in love with the student. You know, probably wouldn't be allowed these days but this is 1919. So, um, yeah, so they became, a, they got married, became a couple and they started they started um, an opera company called the Italo Australian Opera Company, long before there were any you know, subsidies for opera. So they were sort of on a shoestring. They they had one piano player, um, a few different singers, a soprano, a, a baritone, and maybe a, ten, a tenor. They, they, yeah, they started touring Italian 
opera around. Yeah. Made lots of Verdi and Puccini. And, uh, and it, there was a lot of uh, Italian people working in the cane fields in Queensland. So they, one, of their, one of their sort of famous runs, which we used to hear about as kids, was them touring up all the way up to, I think, up to Innisfail. Up to Cairns. Tully, up to yes. Cairns and all, the, all, the, all, around, all around that cane country on the coast. They also went out west to Longreach, Winton, country halls and town halls and, yeah, wherever. So, and then they also played, they did seasons in the capital cities as well. And so was it all finished by the time you were at an age where you could have heard them? Oh, yes. So he died, uh, my grandfather died when... When my mother was ten, okay, she married my nonna. Married, remarried later to a uh, man from Victoria who uh, was complete opposite of Accolade. You know, didn't have a musical bone in his right. body. Loved sport, <laughs> um, but she became very involved in teaching and running choirs and conducting. Uh, she was the first uh, woman to conduct an orchestra in yes. Australia. You know, she lived till she was ninety. Early nineties, so I, I knew her very well. She lived with us for a while, and um, would she make comments about your? Uh, would she compile a list of songs for a best of? She didn't get to that point, but she was. She made. She definitely commented on my singing when she heard it early on. She didn't like it, and uh, she was very concerned I was going to ruin my voice. But then she showed me. She she gave me some singing tips. She showed okay. me about using my diaphragm. Yes, um, and. She also, she sang what's called the bel canto method, which is sort of like you sort of end up getting the voice resonating in the head. Yeah. So she just gave me a few tips about breathing and and using your diaphragm. Um, And the best, she gave me the best piece of advice for going on stage. Um, She said, if you're nervous, just take some time and breathe breathe deeply. And... um, I've used it ever since. It's just really the best thing if you're getting a little bit nervous about going on. Yeah. Breathe deeply. Very simple. But so um, do you get I take nervous? that from her. What's that? Do you get nervous? Yeah. 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 So I breathe deeply when I get nervous. <laughs> but I do have, you know, I also, um, that the breathing really helped. And, you know, I, mean, I sort of pushed back with her a little bit and said, well, I, my singing is not, I don't want to sing pure. I want to be. In a, I want to be. I want to sing. You know, in a more, with more from the point of view of a character, yeah. or you know, my influences got the influences from this this kind of music. You know, she's yeah. blues or 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 soul or or country music. You know, that was not her genre at all. No. So she couldn't quite understand why you'd want to try and sing that way. Yeah. But um. But I was. You know, I was not producing my voice very well when I was younger. So she did help me with that. Yeah. And. Um, uh, and so my, yeah, my, I can, my stamina's good, I can hold long notes and my voice doesn't, my voice doesn't wear out. I can yeah. do long tours and my voice holds up. So that's, um, probably a bit of luck. Thanks for Grandma. Luck, and also a lot of thanks to her. Yeah. In a way, she, she she's always travelling with me too, like the other people I mentioned before, you know. My nonna's always with me. She's because the very basic breath that she gave me, I'm, I'm still breathing it. And we are delighted that you're breathing it. Paul, on behalf of the Australian Music Vault, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thanks.